May I have your attention, please? We are about to begin. Please, may I have your attention? We will we start now. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Antti Suvanto. I'm chairman of the Uri Janssen Foundation. Uh, before we start, I will uh, say a few words about the foundation and about the Uri Janssen Award and uh, the last year's award winners. Uh, Uri Janssen Foundation was uh, is a private uh, foundation founded in 1954 by the widow of Uri, Professor Uri Janssen, Hilma Janssen. Uri Janssen himself uh, passed away already in 1936. The endowment of the foundation is around 75 million euro. An annual distribution is one and a half to two, two million. And the uh, grants are uh, given to research in economics and medicine, and also a special niche is health economics. About 60% of the distribution goes to economics research and 40% to medicine. Uh, Uri Janssen has uh, over the years made a number of initiatives which have had a long legacy. One of the first was Uri Janssen lectures which started already in the 60s. The Janssen Foundation, in fact, uh, brought the, the, the discipline of health economics to Finland in the 70s. The Janssen Foundation started graduate training courses in late uh, 1970s, and the Janssen Award in Economics was uh, established in 1993. These are the uh, names who have delivered Uri Janssen lectures. The first one was Ken Arrow, 1963. And the last one was Daron Asemoklu, last year in April. And uh, there are two, 22 lectures, lecturers, and 10 uh, previous lecturers have uh, win, won a Nobel Prize late. Ken Arrow, John Hicks. John Hicks was invited to Helsinki before the, his Nobel Prize was no. Claire Klein, and you see quite many. Uh, the Janssen Award winners, which is now the 13th uh, time this prize has been awarded. The first uh, uh, winners were Jean-Jacques Lafont, Jean Tirol, 1994. And uh, today we have an honor, honor to have our guests, uh, Oriana Pandiera and Imran Russell, who were awarded the award last year. We have the name of the selection committee, which uh, uh, proposed the prize, and the European Economic Association Board and Uri Janssen uh, Board uh, adopted the proposal. This uh, prize is uh, uh, awarded every second year, and uh, it is a joint enterprise with the EEA, and the Uri Janssen Foundation provides the, the finance, which is the price value of the price is 20,000 euro. Uh, this year's price uh, was awarded to Oriana and Imran, and this is a cut from the EEA announcement. Uh, it is uh, what about it for the work on the role of social relationships in economics, uh, pioneering field experiments in the workplace and social networks. And the ex experiments have become a role model for randomized control trials for incentive treatments. We will be We'll, we'll hear more about it today. Oriana is uh, 
a professor of economics in London School of Economics and has a PhD from Boston College back from year 2000. Her research focus is uh, how monetary incentives and social relationships interact to shape individual choices within organizations and in labor markets. She has been uh, 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 won other prizes before the last year. Perhaps Uri Janssen Abad is the most prestigious in European economics. I hope so. Uh, Imran uh, Russell got his PhD from London School of Economics. He's now professor of University College London and has a number of other activities, including being a managing editor of the journal of the European Economic Association, very important journal in European economics. He has also been prized before. Now we will hear two lectures this afternoon, and uh, I declare this uh, event open and give the floor to Terry Masulski, who is uh, research, uh, Director of Research of the Uri Foundation. Okay, thank you, Antti, for your introduction. So I'm going to give you some practical information of this day. So first, uh, Professor Imran Rasul uh, gives his lecture on policies for human capital accumulation among the world's poor. And then we will have a 15 minutes break. So uh, there will be coffee and some healthy and unhealthy snacks offered uh, in the lobby after the first lecture. And then we will continue on Professor Oriana, uh, Oriana Pandiera's uh, presentation uh, titled The Organizational Economics of the State. So during the lectures, of course, if you have any clarifying questions, please ask. So all the interaction between the uh, lecturers and audience is more than welcome. And after each lecture, there will be time, I guess, for two or three questions. But now, on behalf of the Uri Janssen Foundation, I will give the stage to Professor Imna Rasul. So welcome. Okay. Um, is the microphone working? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so let me start by thanking uh, members of the foundation, uh, both for uh, awarding us the prize and inviting us here today. It's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, with Oriana and uh, our children. It's a chance for them to see what uh, their uh, parents actually really do. Um, <laughs> and so um, I'm going to present uh, an overview of some work that I've been working on for the last 10 years, and I'll describe what I think I'm going to be continue to work on in the, in the next decade. Um, and this is joint work with a large number of co-authors. Um, but I do want to emphasize the type of work that Oriana and I um, won the prize for is often comprised of many, many more people than you just see named on, on each paper. So there's a large team of people who engage in field work on, on our behalf and we collaborate with. That's not just our enumerators or survey workers. It's the survey teams that we're working with, research managers, um, a whole sort of infrastructure that lies behind each of the papers and we're just very fortunate to be part of that and so we very much view the award as essentially a, a, a team-based award and none of it would be possible without the, um, the ability to interact um, and, uh, and, and to meet many of those other uh, very talented individuals. So this is very much um, a collective effort that I'm going to present today. Okay, so let me, let me get cracking. So, I'm going to talk about human capital amongst the world's poorest um, individuals. So labor is going to be very important because it's the key asset that the poor um, have. Most of the world's poor don't own other forms of productive assets such as land or other forms of capital. And so we know from descriptive evidence around the world that the rural poor are very much in engaged in insecure wage labor. Um, they typically engage in activities which have low levels of earnings and very volatile earnings over the course of the year. They're often engaged in multiple different types of activities, both at any given moment in time and over the course of the year. And this is what makes it very difficult to actually measure the income or earnings of the poor because of the, that multiple nature of, of, of work. Some of that is driven by choice. 
that they need to diversify their economic activities in order to smooth idiosyncratic risks that they're subject to. And some of that is driven by constraints, that if you're reliant on agriculture, then demand for, for labour varies across the, the course of the year. And so what's going to be key is that earnings generation is going to be uh, arising through a production function that doesn't really depend on capital, but is primarily determined by, by labour. And so having those key characteristics in mind is really what shaped our thinking over the last decade in trying to design and evaluate policies to impact human capital accumulation amongst the world's poor. And so you can think about this agenda as essentially being split three ways, and I'll, I'll touch upon all three. One is sort of trying to understand how do we measure human capital. The second element is how do we encourage the accumulation of human capital. And the third dimension will be to try to understand the optimal allocation of human capital across labour activities and what enables the poor to do that to, to, to a greater extent. So let me just spend a few words just on measurement issues. So we can often think about uh, human capital as being multidimensional and the way that economists have traditionally thought about uh, human capital is essentially in, in sort of two different classes. One very much related to measures of anthropometrics and health and one very much uh, more related to various measures of, uh, of skills. And there's lots of discussion between economists and other social scientists about how we might want to think about different skills. One way to characterize the long-run development process is essentially a differential rate of return, relative rates of return changing uh, to brains versus brawn. So the top set of characteristics are becoming relatively less important over time as we have a rise of, of, of returns to the bottom set of characteristics. But there are many different ways to classify skills and, uh, um, uh, um, or individual traits. And there's no set way to try to do that, but one way might be to emphasize the sphere of economic activity that we're trying to study. So in the context of education and labor markets, it may be sort of traditional sort of cognitive skills or anthropometrics might be useful. If we're trying to understand the quality of decision making, then other traits such as individuals' uh, ra rationality, their patience, other types of deep structural preferences might play a role, and, and, and so on and so forth. What we're only just scratching the surface of is interacting those types of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, say with uh, measures of, um, sorry, of mental health, for example, which you know is uh, very important whenever we're able to measure mental health in low-income populations. We find surprisingly high levels of, say, rates of depression and various other types of, uh, of uh, severe constraint that individuals face. I think as economists, we're just beginning to understand the relative importance of that and how that might interact with other economic outcomes that we're very much interested in. So this measurement agenda is not something that's going to go away. I think this is very much in, in, in focus, and I'm going to come back to this throughout the papers I'll be discussing. But in terms of the bigger picture for understanding the long-run development process, it's really trying to understand the nature of complementarity or substitutability between these two broad classes of skill, those more brawn-related versus brains-related. As the economy develops and we have trade shocks or technology shocks or various other types of institutional changes, you can imagine the relative rates of return to different types of skills is going to change. So who has those skills? Who's able to accumulate those skills? And what is the interaction across that whole multitude of skills? Is something that could define an agenda in and of itself for, for the forthcoming decade. I'm going to spend the first half of the talk really talking about some... Um, some studies that we've been doing looking at the accumulation of human capital amongst the world's poorest. And so human capital accumulation occurs throughout the life cycle. We have a class of literature thinking about early childhood development, saying what drives human capital accumulation even from the point that you're in utero onwards. Then there are later stages in terms of the gap between education early in life versus starting formal education, the formal education system understanding the transition from formal education into the labour market. We know that's, uh, that's been studied tremendously by, by labour economists. Um, and then once you're in the labour market, then there are other ways to also uh, accumulate human capital as well as reskill over time, such as vocational training as well as training accumulated on the job. And so there are very, all of those various stages of, of the life cycle that we will be uh, trying to study, and I'll, I'll touch upon many of those aspects in, in the papers I'll talk about today. We know that initial conditions matter, so your initial conditions very early in life will play a critical role for your lifetime welfare. There's a mounting body of evidence from economics and other disciplines that seems to suggest those initial conditions, just like in many economic problems, will play a very, very persistent role when trying to understand outcomes later in life. 
But this is a very interesting process to try to understand because of two core features. One is we expect there to be dynamic complementarities across various stages of the life cycle. So when we're trying to understand what are the rates of return um, to any given stage of the life cycle, that partly depends on what that individual has been uh, exposed to earlier in their life. And so that's an important point when we're thinking about the optimal targeting of policy. But the other fundamental uh, difficulty in understanding this process is that the actors that are involved in making these decisions, their objectives and their constraints differ across the life cycle. So whether it's parents being involved or workers and firms being involved, that's going to change depending on which stage of human capital accumulation you're looking at. And so that's going to require some fairly detailed um, primary data collection on all of the different agents that are involved uh, in those various stages. So let me start from the beginning and, and tell you about some recent work I've been doing in terms of early childhood development. Um, and there are you know, some very important proponents of, of this literature in economics now. But now I, I, I'd suggest that there's a body of evidence that suggests that deprivation in early life has consequences throughout the, the, the life course, first order consequences throughout the life course. And so as a result, both economists and policymakers have become very interested in understanding what types of intervention can we have early in life to try to boost human capital, given the rates of return to this could be tremendous, uh, given the, the lifetime benefits that, that, that accrue. And it's been documented that there are both private returns, social returns, and if you believe sort of the latest work of, of Jim Heckman, the latest iterations seem to suggest there are intergenerational returns. So individuals who themselves were treated early in life, when they go on to have children, their children also do better as a, as a result. So you can imagine that the rates of return to these types of program could be tremendous. However, much of the evidence that we have on early childhood development interventions comes from middle income or higher income uh, contexts. And yet the greatest degree of deprivation we observe in terms of just some basic measures of human capital occur in parts of the world that haven't been studied so much in terms of these interventions, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa. So in that context, we have uh, uh, sort of a, a setting in which about a third of children aged under five are stunted. So you're stunted if your height is more than two standard deviations below international norms. So we observe about a third of children subject to those kinds of severe economic deprivation, which we know in higher income settings have persistent impacts and are very hard to, to offset over time. So this is just some data from uh, stunting rates from children under, under five. Um, and this is the sub-Saharan Afri African averages at the top there. The study I'm going to describe is from Nigeria, which is pretty close to the sub-Saharan African average. But Nigeria is a very interesting country because its average level of income is, 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 not, uh, is not too low, but it's a country with tremendous amounts of inequality. And it has real pockets of, uh, of, of deprivation. The part of Nigeria we'll be st uh, studying is in northwest Nigeria, where about 50 to 60 percent of children are stunted at uh, below age five. So it's going to be amongst the poorest parts on, on, within the continent and as a consequence amongst the most uh, deprived levels of human capital on, on, on the planet. So we're going to be studying an intervention that we've been running for four years now in these uh, two states in northwest Nigeria. These are incredibly poor, volatile and food insecure locations. These are going to be populations which don't have guaranteed food over the course of the year, about 15 to 20 percent of households report there are times of the year when there simply isn't any food available and then they have to resort to fairly extreme coping strategies. About 65 percent of our children will be stunted at baseline and about 70 percent of households will be residing in extreme poverty, so uh, residing in less than $1.90 per day. So this is amongst the worst initial conditions you could imagine on the planet. And I'm going to try to show you the results of what, what happened as we had a four-year intervention to look at, uh, to try to tackle some of these extreme outcomes um, um, amongst, the, uh, amongst the population. Okay, so the intervention that we're going to evaluate using a randomized control trial is a bundled intervention that has two key components. The first key component is going to be the provision of information uh, to both mothers and fathers. So we'll have a comparison to try to understand whether uh, there are differences between, between parental responses uh, to the program. And the information that we provide covers both the antenatal period, the perinatal period and the postnatal period. So the types of information are going to relate to if you're pregnant, go to a local health clinic to receive a checkup, take um, iron supplements and so on and so forth. At the time of, at the time of birth, try to give birth in, in the presence of a trained attendant. 
And then in terms of postnatal messages, the emphasis is very much on when the child is born, start breastfeeding the child immediately, exclusively breastfeed the child for the first six months of life. That's going to be a vital piece of information we want people to adhere to because the next best alternative to breastfeeding is to give a child water. Water in this part of the world is really something that you don't want to give any child, never mind a newborn, and that's what's going to be driving lots of the very poor economic outcomes and health outcomes we'll observe amongst young children at baseline. It's because parents don't have this knowledge. In fact, about 13% of mothers as well as fathers at baseline report that the best practice would be to exclusively breastfeed the child. The other 85% say that it's okay to give the child water uh, every now and again. So we're going to com combine those very uh, simple messages of information, but ones that we've designed specifically for this context because that's where information deficits were most lacking. We're going to combine that information with high-valued and persistent cash transfers that we'll provide to mothers. Those cash transfers, as I said, are high value. They correspond to about $20 per month, irrespective of which benchmark you want to use. That's a lot of money to be given these households. It corresponds to about 80-90% of female earnings um, at, at baseline. And the cash transfers are provided for a long period of time. You start receiving the cash transfers as soon as you, you can verify that you're pregnant using a, a urine sample. And then you receive those cash transfers on a monthly basis for the first 24 months of the child's life. So on average, for households that are eligible and take up the program, they receive about 470 US dollars over the course of those two years, two and a half years. That's a large amount of resources to be dropping onto these, uh, to these households. You're eligible for the program as soon as you uh, can verify that you're pregnant. We're going to evaluate this using a randomized control trial. So in some villages, we randomly assign the program to, to, uh, to take place. And then we have control villages that will remain as controls for the four years of the evaluation that, that I'll show you. The data that I'm going to show you then is going to be tracking 3,600 pregnant mothers as well as their children, both at baseline, two years later, and four years later. Okay, so this is going to be a common theme that I'm going to come back to in a lot of the evaluations that we've been doing. As economists, things really become interesting in the longer term. Okay, so a lot of the evaluations I'm going to talk about are four years, seven years, one of them hopefully we'll get to would be 11 years. It's very important to try to put in the infrastructure to really understand the dynamic responses here, especially when you're thinking about human capital accumulation. The short run can be very misleading for understanding how we move from one steady state to another steady state. Okay, so we're going to be tracking those mothers as well as their children over this time uh, and, and collecting outcomes on, on, on both those parties as well as on, on, on the father as well. And so what happened as a result of the program? Uh, there were tremendous impacts on children's outcomes, both measured in terms of their anthropometrics as, and uh, measured in terms of other health outcomes. So this is just some examples of, uh, of, of those outcomes. So if we just look at stunting rates, the, the likelihood of a child being more than two standard deviations below international norms, we see reductions of stunting rates of eight percentage points, um, eight percent, sorry, at midline, and seven percent at endline. In terms of extreme stunting, that falls by 14 percent at midline and 14 percent at endline. And there are other big improvements in terms of uh, health, in terms of an incidence of diarrhea as people substitute away from giving children water. Um, and then we have an increase in deworming and a tremendous increase in vaccination rates amongst individuals. And all of this is very much related to the types of information that we provided to, uh, to parents. Okay, so two things to notice there. One, the impacts are large, no matter which metric you want to use, compared to the body of evidence that we have on early ch childhood development, the, the impacts here are very large on all of these different metrics. But even more importantly, these impacts last beyond the first two years of the child's life. Okay, remember the evaluation is running for four years, the resources are only provided for the first two years, and so the impacts are not dying out as soon as we remove the, the cash transfer. Something is allowing these impacts to be sustained over time. So let me give you an indication of what's going on there, what's driving these results. So in the first two years of life, we document how the provision of information to both mothers and fathers is central for driving these uh, outcomes for children, both in terms of the anthropometrics and in terms of the health improvements. Those were essentially being driven by the information, the improved knowledge that parents have, the improved actual practices that parents engage with, uh, engaging with, with their child. So those are very much first order. We find some evidence that mothers, um, the information that's provided to mothers has higher rates of return than the information provided to fathers. 
But the resource channel turns out to be key for sustaining these impacts beyond the two years that we initially provided uh, the transfers for. Why? Because giving large amounts of cash transfers and giving transfers that households can see as being relatively certain over a long period of time is very different to the normal types of very volatile income stream these households are used to uh, being subject to. So given that length of time, the certainty and the magnitude, households use those resources as much for investment purposes than for consumption purposes. They do use some of it to consume, they consume more food, they change the composition of food, but more importantly, we see important forms of in investment taking place. In particular, we see women engaging in greater forms of self-employment and purchasing assets that allow them to engage in self-employment activities. What's the number one income generating process that women uh, are engaged in this part of the world? It's rearing livestock. And so what are they doing with the cash? They're saving some of the cash, they're purchasing livestock, and livestock has a couple of nice traits. The first is it's, a, it's, it's an asset that uh, can provide some form of insurance, but it also provides a ste steady stream of income to households over the course of the years. You can sell milk, uh, meat, and other animal produce to other households. And so what that's allowing these households to do is use the resources that we provide to change their labor supply, change their asset base, and endogenously change their own earnings. And so what we find is that for every dollar that we provide using the unconditional cash transfer, that leads to an endogenous increase in household earnings of a further dollar okay, through all of these other margins. And so essentially the program pays for itself through just that earnings channel, even if we ignore trying to put a price on all the impacts on children's outcomes. Okay. So the key aspect of uh, livestock is not just that it generates this stable earning stream, but you can also self-consume uh, the produce that you're, that you're producing, which is providing children with protein-rich food as a result. Okay. So here what I'm, what I'm showing is livestock ownership, and this is by the woman specifically, so women buy animals and they retain ownership of the animals. This is not women giving the transfer to their husband, the husband buying the animals. This, this is a, a context in which bargaining power amongst women is relatively high. So we see big increases in the purchase of milk producing animals, commonly eaten animals and egg producing animals. And then that feeds through, if we classify seven different types of food group, the orange bars here correspond to the increase over time in percentage terms of the consumption of those types of food group by the child uh, that was in utero at baseline. So that, uh, four years later, they're consuming many more dairy products, many more flesh food and eggs. Okay? And the green bars show us the additional earnings expenditure on those food groups that the household is engaged in. So food is a normal good. We're seeing expansions of all of these different food groups. But the gap between these bars is essentially what's being produced at home and doesn't need to be purchased from the market. So what's going on is essentially these children are able to consume many more flesh foods and eggs and that is feeding back into sustaining some of these improved anthropometric and, uh, and health outcomes. The reason for that is just emerging in the, in the biological uh, literature, and the medical literature, which seems to suggest that the consumption of animal proteins early in life is first order for both the phys physical and neurological development of children. And so that, they're some of the channels that we're picking up. So providing livestock doesn't just provide resources to the household. If you self-consume a part of the, the output of the livestock, give that back to the children. That in itself allows for human capital accumulation of those children. We're currently trying to go back and have a six-year evaluation of the children to see whether we can then pick up improvements in their cognitive outcomes as a result of this change in nutrition and resources and information of parents early in their life. Okay. And so the internal rate of return to the program varies between 10 and 20 percent, depending on exactly which assumptions you want to make and how you want to try, tr try to price these benefits on, on, on children. But fundamentally, the intervention shows that these types of early life interventions can be implemented in very deprived populations where state capacity is very weak as well. These interventions do work even in these very extreme settings and seem to be um, profitable for, for the social planner to, to engage in. There's, there's lots of other questions that we uh, still want to come back to understanding, and I'll talk about some of these on, on the final slide. Okay, let's move to the next stage of the life cycle, which is thinking about human capital uh, accumulation in adolescence. 
Okay, and so we have a series of projects that we've been working on trying to understand human capital accumulation amongst uh, young girls and women who are just making the transition out of formal schooling uh, into the labour market. And so we think if we look back at US economic history, sort of women being able to uh, control their, their, their bodies or getting access to other forms of, uh, of technology has been a, a big sort of driver of women's improved human capital and, and, and status uh, in, in the US. In very low income settings, there's very much an interaction between some of the constraints on human capital accumulation and health that, you, that young women face. So, for example, it's quite, uh, we have quite sort of a high rates of teen pregnancy and early motherhood in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, and that in itself reduces the ability to invest in human capital. But the mere fact that labour market opportunities are often missing in these economies reduces incentives to invest in human capital in the first place and increases incentives to in invest in ver various risky behaviours. And so there's essentially a vicious cycle that's going on in both health markets and labour markets that are compounding these very poor initial conditions for, for girls and adolescents. Okay. But many policy interventions have often targeted either just trying to improve labour market opportunities or trying to improve the health status of, of, of young girls. So what we tried to do was introduce a new type of intervention that tried to tackle both of these constraints at the same time. And this we were fortunate to do with an NGO called, uh, called BRAC. And they've expanded a programme called the Empowerment uh, and Livelihoods for Adolescents programme, the ELA programme, which they first developed in, in, in South Asia, and then we helped to export and adapt that programme to the sub-Saharan African uh, context. Essentially what the programme does is it operates in rural areas, establishes a club, uh, or you can think of that as a safe space where girls can go and receive various types of, uh, of, of intervention. There's two classes of intervention. One is to provide girls what we call life skills training, which, in, which includes uh, knowledge about health, um, about uh, safer uh, practices as well as their own uh, decision uh, making rights and negotiation skills. And a second component of the, of the programme is to provide girls vocational skills training to allow them to set up their own forms of self-employment activity. So it's really trying to tra tackle both the health as well as the human capital constraints um, directly. You're eligible for the programme if you're a girl aged between 12 and 24. And again, we're going to evaluate this programme using a randomised control trial. This uh, intervention takes place in Uganda in which we have sort of very high rates of teen pregnancy to, to begin with. And again, we're going to be tracking about 5,000 adolescent girls. We're going to track them uh, for, for four years. Okay, again, to understand not just the short-run impacts, but essentially do things peter out um, over time, or do we actually see an accumulation of impacts over time? Okay, and so the next slide just summarises uh, the results from the intervention. Okay, this is what the, what the clubs actually uh, look like, if you, if you want to see some pictures. Um, and so these are the main classes of outcomes that we then look at. So these are the four-year impacts uh, along three different dimensions. So in terms of economic activities, four years later as a result of the program, we see girls being significantly more likely to be engaged in some income generating activity that rises by about 70%. That's mostly driven by self-employment. And we also see an increase in earnings as a result that's picked up in expenditure um, on, on a monthly basis by about 38%. In terms of measures of control over the body, we see improved knowledge of pregnancy that lasts, you know, four years after the program first starts, improved knowledge of HIV-related um, information. If girls report being sexually active, they're much more likely to always be using a condom. And most strikingly, we see a large reduction amongst treated girls of them reporting having had sex unwillingly uh, in the last year. And so you see big changes in women's ability to control their body, and that's in part driving some of these labour market outcomes as we're changing the relative returns of investing in your home, hum, own human capital rather than engaging in other forms of risky activity. And then that has some hard economic outcomes uh, that's probably going to be good markers of, uh, of uh, their impacts over the life cycle in the sense that we see reductions relative to the control group of these young girls having had children four years later, being much less likely to be married or cohabiting at that point, and much more independent setting up their own careers uh, before engaging in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in marriage. 
we see a slight improvement in when they would prefer their daughters to get married. And in terms of overall gender empowerment, we, we see a rise. Okay, so we think of these as essentially being the best markers for long-term welfare for these girls. But it's an intervention which is multifaceted, which we see impacts on both the economic dimensions, the health dimensions, as well as on some of these uh, dimensions of empowerment. So the program is very effective. The program is also cost effective. It's a very cheap program to deliver. You just need to rent at one location in some of these rural locations, train one of the girls, one of the older girls to provide the life skills, and then you just need some other trained workers to provide the vocational skills. So the cost per potential beneficiary is 18 US dollars at the time in, in, in Uganda. The measurable benefit that, we, uh, that we're able to price just from the expenditures is about $30 per, per potential beneficiary. The program pays for itself within a few years. And here we're underestimating the benefits because there's a large number of benefits that we're not trying to price at all. You can think of all of those as increasing above the 32. So when we ended up with these results, we checked them, we double-checked them, we were extremely delighted. We thought this is a great intervention targeting this very vulnerable population. Let's just go and do this again and again. Okay, and so at the time, we decided on two further locations where we wanted to extend the program. One was Sierra Leone, one was South Sudan. Okay, tragically, both of those uh, locations were hit by large aggregate shocks, whether it's the context of the Ebola crisis or the civil war in southern Sudan. However, it does also present an opportunity for researchers to try to understand if we have these types of intervention being implemented, to what extent do they allow households or young girls to insure against these types of aggregate shock? Okay, so I'll show you the results from Sierra Leone where the same intervention was implemented during the crisis. We evaluate that again using a randomized control trial and it's just going to be an opportunistic study that allows us to understand how do households cope in the face of aggregate shocks. And we understand there's a large literature from Rob Townsend's sort of famous paper in, in the 90s about how households respond to idiosyncratic shocks, a lot of the ex-ante and ex-post actions that they take. As economists, we don't have that much information about how households respond to aggregate shocks when everybody's hit by, by, by a common shock. So there's a question. Have you received any pushback from religious organizations when you're giving girls can I talk about that in five slides' time? I have one slide that addresses that specifically. And that's going to be very interesting. It's context-specific. In Uganda, no. In Sierra Leone, the social norms that we're trying to adjust are very different. And those will be highlighted in some of our results. Okay, so let me show you what happened in Sierra Leone. So this is the outbreak, the Ebola crisis, the timeline of the Ebola crisis that, that occurred um, in Sierra Leone throughout West Africa, actually, in 2014-15. It was the, one of the most severe outbreaks of Ebola that, that we've observed. It was actually the severest since Ebola was first discovered in, in the 1970s. And so you see that the outbreak occurs in, uh, in, in, uh, towards the end of uh, May 2014. There's rapid contagion. Um, with, uh, within the country, so a few months later, you know, the entire country has been affected, and that's not surprising. Sierra Leone is both a small country, and given its history of civil war, it's a country in which people are used to sort of being very mobile within the country o over time. And so the types of policy that were put into place uh, are the standard policies that humans have used for centuries to deal with sort of viral outbreaks. Uh, those are to enforce quarantines, to prevent individuals moving both within a country and across countries. That causes a complete collapse of economic activity within Sierra Leone. Its growth rate went from plus 8% to minus 2% within a year. So a complete loss of economic opportunities for both men and women. This, that's the nature of the aggregate shock. Um, and then schools were closed for the entire academic year uh, during the, the crisis. Typically, what policymakers try to do is prevent individuals congregating. Schools are a natural place to try to, uh, to, try to close. And then schools are reopened towards the tail end of the, of the crisis. Okay, so you, that's, that's the timeline of the crisis. And then that matches quite similarly with the timeline of our work in Sierra Leone because we just ran our baseline survey uh, literally, our last survey was completed a week before the first case was reported. Okay, so we're going to have accurate information about individual, the lives of these adolescent girls just pre-crisis. And then we were able to return to the country uh, two years later, long after schools had reopened, to measure impacts uh, two years later. So we don't have many measures during the crisis, but we're going to track the same girls before and after the crisis. Okay. During the crisis, we still had the same ELA program, 
the provision of these safe spaces and the skills provided to girls uh, as implemented by, by a randomized control trial. Okay, let me, let me skip through that. Okay, so, sorry. Okay, so this is, uh, in terms of the clubs that were open, the program wasn't perfectly operating, but we do observe the share of locations which, which had a club operating who eventually reached 100% by, by the end of the crisis. But 70% of the locations that should have been treated were treated and did have a safe space provided for girls uh, over the course of this crisis. Okay? And then what I'm going to show you are what are the impacts on girls in terms of their human capital well after the crisis is finished. Remember, we're, our survey was only able to be rerun in 2016, schools have reopened. The world potentially could be back to where it was pre-crisis if we just think of this aggregate shock as essentially providing temporary, um, uh, temporary impacts. Okay. So let me show you what happened. So first of all, we're going to classify villages as those where the, where the effect of Ebola is relatively weak uh, and villages that had high levels of disruption from Ebola. Okay. So what this shows you is for young girls who are aged 12 to 17 at baseline, what is the impact of going from uh, little Ebola to a, a place that was more affected by Ebola um, over those two years? And so what we see is that two years later, if you've been struck by a more intense Ebola outbreak, girls are much less likely to be exclusively enrolled back in school. They're much more likely now to be engaged only in work and a little bit less likely to, to be engaged in both activities simultaneously. Essentially, what the aggregate crisis does is speed up the transition from school into work for young girls. Okay, when the crisis is over, we don't see girls returning back to school. Okay, schools are now reopened at this point, but the effect of Ebola is, is essentially to kick girls out of school and not allow them to, to return, and they enter the labor market at an earlier age, and they may have found optimal absent in the crisis. What does our intervention do? Our intervention offsets those negative impacts. So in places with high disruption, the dark blue areas, what the intervention done is, it does is slow down this transition from school into work to allow girls to essentially stay in school to a greater extent than absent the intervention. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at some of those mechanisms. Those, those results hold for younger girls as a sort of placebo check our intervention doesn't do much in terms of the activities of older girls who weren't in school to begin with. So they're essentially continuing life uh, before and after in, in, in the same way. Okay. So in terms of their time allocation, this is where we start to see some of the mechanisms that were allowing the, uh, the safe spaces to essentially play such a big role. So we're just focusing on, on, the, on, the, on the younger girls. This just shows you what I, what I mentioned before, that the effect of disruption is to cause girls to spend less time learning, more time working, more time engaged in household chores, which might be a risky activity given that the nature of the Ebola crisis means that uh, if you come into contact with infected relatives, you're much more likely to, to, to catch the virus. Um, and our intervention causes girls to sustain the degree of learning to reduce the exposure to household chores but then interestingly, we start to see big reductions in leisure time amongst our girls in both high and low uh, intensely treated places. And that's also true for older girls. Okay? In both locations, girls are spending about three hours per week in the ELA clubs. But there's a big reduction in what they're reporting as leisure time. Okay? So what is leisure in these contexts? So leisure, we asked about various different categorizations of leisure. One activity of leisure is spending time with men. Okay, so remember, what's going on in the background? In the background here, you have a big aggregate shock, economic opportunities being destroyed for everybody. Okay? And so what happens as a result of the crisis is that girls in, uh, in just high disruption places, absent our intervention, are exposed much, to much more time with men. And that's really what's being reduced a lot, both for younger girls as well as for older girls. The safe spaces are serving a role, not just to provide the information and the life skills, but also just literally as a safe space where girls can go absent any, any, any uh, uh, male uh, also being present there. Okay? Now to come back to your earlier question, in terms of time allocation, we see a big reduction in girls spending time either in volunteer work or ch church work or other kinds of social activities. Okay? That's true both for younger girls and older girls. Okay. 
that's important in the context of your question because the main institution that would otherwise be providing information to girls in the context of Sierra Leone are what are known as secret societies. And these were essentially gender-specific societies that occur throughout Sierra Leone. They're called secret societies for a reason. It's very hard to ask individuals about these. We have to use the euphemism of volunteering activities. But these were essentially uh, societies that have been in existence for centuries that is essentially initiate girls into, into rites of passage and, uh, and, and teach them about these various types of risky behavior. So we're crowding out that source of information. We're seeing a reallocation of time away from those societies towards the ELA clubs. As a result, girls are spending less time with men and then that's having a direct impact that was driving the human capital results I showed you before. Because when we start to look at impacts such as the frequency of sex, that reduces uh, with our treatments when Ebola is particularly disruptive. That leads to a reduction in unprotected sex and that reduces out of wedlock pregnancy by about seven or eight percentage points. Absent our intervention, girls are being exposed to much more unprotected sex. They're 10 percentage point more likely to become pregnant, mostly driven by out of wedlock pregnancy and that's what prevents girls getting back into school ex post. Okay, the magnitude of these effects are really quite similar. All of this is compounded by a policy that the Sierra Leone government put into place at the time of the crisis, which said that if a girl is pregnant, she's not allowed to go back into school. Tanzania has a similar policy. There have been calls for a long time for these policies to be dropped. They're just sort of hitting girls with a double whammy. But that's the reason why being, uh, being pregnant is so costly for girls, that essentially there's, a, there's an infinite constraint of them getting back into school. What the program does is allow that, that pattern of human capital accumulation to, 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 be, uh, to continue because it protects girls during this time of crisis. It exposes them less to men as measured by time allocations. As a result, that impacts hard outcomes such as becoming pregnant that allows them to then become much more likely to re-enter school once schools reopen. Okay, so the Ebola crisis, what, what that type of aggregate shock does it speeds up the transition for young women out of school into the labour market permanently. It's not one that can be reversed just because schools have been reopened. The ELA intervention allows us to offset or to slow down that process to some extent and the mechanism for that is through the provision of a safe space, lower pregnancy rates and then higher rates of, uh, of, of returning back into school. One thing this does is using a randomised control trial provides us the first indication I think that we have of wh what types of insurance might be needed during the types of aggregate shock when economic opportunities for everybody have, have been dramatically reduced. And so we've been fortunate enough to, to be able to go back and run a six year follow up where for the first time we're going to be surveying men in much more detail. Okay, our intervention was designed before the Ebola crisis was known. We had no intention of surveying men. We just wanted to do what we did in Uganda, just repeat it. So we don't have much information about men's beliefs, activities at all. But in this long run follow up, we can see one, whether the impacts on the girls are sustained um, and really try to understand the dynamics of aggregate shocks. But even more importantly, is to try to understand what's happened to beliefs and human capital amongst men a a as a result. If you invite us back in two years time, we can tell you those results. Okay, third uh, categorization is on the allocation of human capital. Okay. So now I'm going to think about uh, the choice between different activities. Okay. The poor are typically quite restricted in their choices, but even so we see a large number of puzzles in these types of economies where in many village economies you have a limited number of uh, activities you can engage in, but hugely different rates of return to those activities. So why isn't there just an equalization of those rates of return? This is what Arthur Lewis uh, classified as sort of the dual economy. Why do we see this persistence in, in sort, of, uh, sort of economies where we don't observe individuals moving from one to, one to another? And so this is very much what I described at the start of the lecture, that you know, households are engaged in very forms of insecure wage labour, predominantly working with their own uh, human capital, not combining that with other forms of productive capital. We're of course used to thinking about dualism in terms of rural to urban migration. I mean, Tadaro and, and uh, Harris and Tadaro have written about that in the 70s, and you know, uh, the Roy model can, can be thought about as a special case of that. 
where rural to urban migration, the great debate for 40, 50 years amongst economists, does that d depend on comparative advantage or does that, is that determined by selection? We're going to try to use similar technologies to understand just rural labour markets to begin with and understand w which activities households engage in. Urban labour markets are going to be characterised much more by the existence of various search frictions. So in urban areas we're going to think about the problem as how do workers and firms search for each other, what might be preventing the most efficient searches taking place. And so now we have a body of work thinking about both urban labour markets and rural labour markets. And let, let me just describe uh, some results from both of those. So let me start with urban labour markets. So in just about any country on the planet, we always observe youth unemployment rates being at least as high as adult unemployment rates. And obviously economists have been thinking about this again for decades and saying what, what might be driving that and what can policymakers do. And so essentially we have two classes of explanation of why young people suffer unemployment rates at a, at a greater rate. The first class of explanation emphasises that pre-labour market factors are just very different, that young workers lack the skills or they lack the information uh, to, to generate employment. And the second class of explanation is, is more of an ex-post explanation or an, ex, uh, an explanation that's very much more focused on firms that says that young workers face various barriers to entry into the labour market. So firms might lack the resources to either find appropriately skilled young workers, to screen them or to train them on the job. And so that's going to be our starting point for this, for this set of uh, uh, projects, which is to understand that search process of how workers find jobs and how firms actually find good workers. Okay, and essentially we want to understand how do, not just how do workers find jobs, but how do they find good jobs. The whole process of development can be characterised as moving away from this type of insecure wage labour to moving more towards more stable forms of employment, perhaps more formal forms of employment that in turn can drive fiscal capacity and what we think of as being structural change which then feeds back into the, into the provision of these types of, uh, of firms overall. Okay. So our third example, trying to understand this process in urban labour markets, comes from a, 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 you know, a six year, seven year evaluation we've been running following a panel of workers and firms and then interfering in these labour markets using a, a randomised control trials. Okay, so what's nice about this is that it's going to take place in Uganda and it's going to be a two-sided randomised control trial. So we're going to be tracking both workers and firms in these labour markets and that's going to be important, coming back to a point that I made on, on, the, on the second slide, which is that many processes of human capital accumulation have multiple actors involved in that. In, in the context here, we're going to think about workers and firms as interacting and it's going to be important to track both of them to really understand equilibrium outcomes here. So the workers that we've been tracking for, for the last six or seven years are workers who are just entering the labour market. On average, they're age 20, equal number of men and women. These are all individuals with low levels of human capital to begin with, but they're making that very important first transition into the labour market. How on earth do these guys find jobs? Okay. And the firms that we'll be tracking are small and medium-sized enterprises. These are firms on average with about three, four em uh, employees. They're focusing on uh, eight specific sectors that, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll come to. They cover both manufacturing and service sectors. They're dotted around 15 urban labour markets throughout, uh, throughout Uganda. As I said, this is a two-sided experimental design. So we're going to have treatment and control workers, treatment and control firms. Okay, we're going to look at the interaction between all of those. And what I'll present today is a randomised control trial that measures the impacts on workers and, and firms of varying two forms of human capital accumulation that, that workers can engage in. One is that we offer a subset of workers the ability to be vocationally trained in a vocational training institute for six months in a sector-specific skill. Okay, and we're going to offer that training using existing sort of private sector vocational training institutes um, and we're going to train them in one of the eight sectors in which we're tracking firms. Okay. Most workers take up that offer. This offer, how, what's the cost to the social planner of training a worker? It's about $450 to train these workers for this six-month training course. Okay. This is orders of magnitude larger than the earnings of these workers at baseline. We don't think they have the credit uh, to acquire this training themselves. Okay. We're going to compare that to um, providing firms the offer of a wage subsidy to take on an observationally similar worker and to train that worker within the firm for an equivalent period of time, for six months within the firm. Okay. That's right. That, 
That's right, that's right. So that's going to be one of the eligibility criteria that you can't ha have voc been vocationally trained before. So these are going to be, the VT workers are going to be those who've just finished formal, uh, formal uh, education and are now transiting into the labour market. And then the other group of workers are going to be offered to firms where we're incentivizing firms to train these workers using just a classic apprenticeship structure. We're essentially saying, I'm going to subsidize you, you train the worker as you would like to for the next six months. And that's going to replicate the two contractual forms that we observe, not just in Uganda, but throughout the world, as the main ways that individuals acquire human capital after they've left the formal education system. Either you go through some form of vocational training or you're trained as an apprentice on the job. So now we're going to have a horse race between those two forms of, of training in this particular context. We're going to do this in Uganda where youth unemployment rates are very high. There's a very skewed age distribution. Youth unemployment rates are about 60% here. And these are very common forms of training that we observe, but are typically going to be unavailable to workers ex ante. The cost of one of these apprenticeships, depending on which assumptions you want to make, is between three and 500 US dollars. Okay, so the training sits somewhere in between, but this is, again, orders of magnitude more expensive than the workers themselves could, uh, could afford. The first order constraint, we're relaxing our, our credit constraints. Okay, what's the key distinction between these two forms of training? The key theoretical distinction is that when you complete vocational training, you leave a training institute with a certificate. You leave with a piece of paper that shows that you have this training. Okay, when you, ob when you uh, obtain a similar set of skills through a firm, there's no credible way for you to signal that you have those skills uh, accumulated. So there are going to be differential returns to certification in this economy because the vocational training is going to provide you a certificate which then uh, is going to be exploitable by workers uh, later on. That's going to be the key difference. So the first stage of the project is to try to measure what were the human capital impacts of these two forms of training on workers. We find, you know, using various tests, both sets of workers uh, have more skills. That those are sustained three, four, five, six years later. Both sets of workers earn more relative to the control group, but there's quite a big difference in the patterns or the dynamic patterns between the two. Okay. In particular, okay, so this just shows you from the start of our intervention over the, over the first three years, and the, and the results run longer now, on a quarterly basis, what were the employment rates for these workers in the control group, those who went through the apprenticeship program and those that were vocationally trained? Okay, and if you had uh, wages on, on, on the, or earnings on the y-axis, the figure would look quite similar. Okay? So what happens is the following. It's all in, in the dynamics. Okay? If you just look at the averages, relative to the control group, uh, earnings for vocational trained workers rise by 30%. For apprentices, they rise by 24%. Relative to the control group, these guys have more skills. The market's willing to pay for them. That's fine. But the interesting stuff is in the dynamics. So what we observe here is if you trace out the, um, uh, the, the apprentices, the firm trained workers, you see initially they find employment at a greater rate because they've been matched to a firm, but over time they fall back to what's happening to the control group. Okay? Whereas the vocational trainees take longer to find employment, but once they do, they diverge away from the other two groups. What's going on is that when we write down a, a structural model that emphasizes transitions from unemployment back into employment and job-to-job -job transitions, the key distinction between these workers is that when, full -time, when firm trained workers fall off the job ladder, when they become unemployed, they can't ever prove their history of employment. This is Uganda, they don't have the certificate. So their dynamics from thereafter look almost identical to the control group. Once they fall off the job ladder into unemployment, it's as if they were never skilled to begin with. And so all the time, you've got to imagine these FT workers falling into unemployment and then following the control group, falling into unemployment, following the control group, and that's why the two are converging over time. In contrast, the workers who have vocational training have a similar set of skills as the, as the firm trained workers, but they can prove that they've got those skills. So when they fall into unemployment, they spend much less time in unemployment and make that transition from unemployment back into the job ladder at a much quicker rate. And that unemployment to job transition is much higher for workers with these certified skills, and that allows them over time to move further up the job ladder and diverge away. 
And it's that, that dynamic difference that's really uh, driving these um, experimental differences between the two. This is an economy in which there are huge returns to certification. But returns to certification have also been shown for the US and other sort of middle income countries as well. Yeah. Yeah, so th there's some extent to which uh, the firm trained workers have more firm specific uh, tra uh, human capital, but it's not a stark difference between the two. And th the details for that we can give in the paper. What we were really trying to do is trying to mimic both types of human capital accumulation uh, for, uh, for workers. We don't find much evidence that the skills that they have are that different between the two. At least it's not, the differences that I'm highlighting here are not attributable to the bundle of skills that they end up with. So we have uh, various different metrics. We have sort of formal tests, which we uh, took a little while to develop, which are sector specific, which we ask workers to, to do. Then we ask them a series of questions about how they view tran the transferable skills. We have, uh, we have adapted the ONET uh, modules for, the, for these particular, uh, to look at the tasks that these workers are engaged in within the firm to see those differences. So there's a whole variety of different ways that we try to measure both their cognitive skills as well as changes in their non-cognitive skills as well. We don't see much impact on the non-cogs, on the, cogniz on the cognitives, on the general versus uh, firm specific, there's not much difference in the bundle they receive. So this is really driven by certification more than anything else. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's very interesting. It seems that it would be a good policy to certify these firm skills. Yeah. So that, that's something that we come back to. Let me, let me talk about sort of the bigger picture here. So when we just calculate the internal rate of return to these two programs, for the firm trained workers, the internal rate of return is about 10%. That's pretty good compared to many other development policies. It's better than the London housing market. But the vocationally trained uh, workers, you know, they have an internal rate of return of about 20%. So it pays for the social planner to try to provide vocational training rather than support apprentices, it, given the large returns to certification in this economy. Okay. Sorry, there was a question. Um, one of the things you might think about driving this is that the certifications are still relatively rare. Do you have any sense of sort of as you scale this up and more people are certified? So at baseline, we observe about 30% of workers in these SMEs having some form of vocational training. So employers are quite used to seeing this form of vocational training. It's not something new that we're introducing to the market. There are literally hundreds of VTIs that are operating throughout Uganda. This is a pre-existing market. So this is not new information. But obviously, as you scale up and everybody were to get that, we know the returns would fall. So we try to do some, um, uh, some counterfactuals using the structural model of what would happen if you targeted different workers and how the returns could be higher if you targeted workers of, of slightly different traits than, than our workers as well. But that's a very interesting question. But given that we start with 60% unemployment rates, here we're just thinking about improving on the margin. There's still plenty of scope before the general equilibrium effects really become first order. OK. So why were our returns so high? And this is going to come back to sort of what do we learn here for, for, for policy apart from we should certify skills. So what this just shows you is a, is a summary of a meta-analysis that David McKenzie did of similar programs in, in low-income settings. And so this just shows effect sizes uh, for various different interventions in the literature on employment impacts. This is for earnings impacts. And these are from other studies, and our study results are highlighted at the top. Okay? So most other studies find null impacts. Confidence intervals go over zero effect size. And so when you talk to policymakers, and when I spoke to my colleagues at UCL 10 years ago about this project, they're like, why on earth are you doing this stuff? We know that uh, training doesn't work. If we look in Scandinavia, if we look in Germany, if we look in the US, the evidence of returns to uh, training tend to be relatively uh, uh, low, if not negative. Okay. So what made this work? And it's a combination of uh, uh, sort of things that we did specifically and things that are uh, subject to the setting. The first is that we focused in on particular sectors. We didn't allow workers uh, to go and get trained in any sector. We said you have to be trained in eight sectors, and those were sectors that we believe have very high rates of return to vocational training. In fact, the Mincerian returns to training in this context is about 50%. We show that the experimental return to 30%, the self-selection that's driving the Mincerian is the other 20%. Okay, so this is a context in which the skills are still sufficiently rare for there to be huge returns to vocational training. 
Okay. Workers were selected into our sample in a very precise way. They were recruited by saying to them, would you like to receive vocational training for six months? Okay, and it's only a particular type of worker that's going to take up that opportunity. It's somebody who's willing to forgo six months of labour market opportunities. We have particularly patient individuals in our sample. One of the counterfactuals we did is what would have happened if we targeted more impatient individuals where the returns would drop. Okay, patience actually interacts with the skills accumulation uh, that we find. So if, for example, we'd incentivize workers to enter our study by saying, would you like to be an apprentice, then you're going to get very low patient people, because very impatient people, because they're taking the returns up front, whereas the way we recruit individuals are those who are willing to backload their returns. Okay, so worker selection is very important, and that's what drives some of the counterfactuals. Other elements, we're very lucky, we have low attrition. You can see our point estimates are quite similar to other studies. Our standard errors are much tighter. But the key thing, and this is coming back to your earlier point, is that uh, we only worked with five vocational training institutes. We didn't choose them randomly. We chose them as having the best reputation in Uganda. Don't ask me what I mean by reputation, but you know, we kind of all, all know this when we, when we see it. Okay? And so we didn't choose these guys randomly. And so there's a couple of interesting questions there. One is the IO of the market. We think that there's a long left tail of low productivity VTIs that are not going to generate these kinds of returns. There's something special about trying to match these particularly motivated workers with these high quality VTIs that's generating these returns. That means that as a policymaker, credit constraints are not enough. You don't just want to give these uh, workers $400 to go and spend themselves to get the training because unless they know which are the more reputable VTIs, they're going to use that unconditional cash, tra uh, the conditional cash transfer to, to, provide, uh, to go to a low quality VTI. That's why similar studies that have provided workers with transfers to get trained themselves typically don't work because there's lots of evidence that workers have imperfect information in these markets. One of those sources of asymmetric information is about VTI quality. So you can't replicate these results, I believe, just by giving a transfer to, to young individuals. The key constraints are a combination of credit and information constraints that we're resolving here. And obviously, you know, if you could have certified skills provided by employers, as we see in higher income settings, that would be a way to, to solve this, uh, this ultimate friction as well. Then in rural labour markets, let me spend the remaining uh, time just talking about this last example and then trying to come full circle. So in rural labour markets, the key aspect is that individuals are engaged in very insecure wage labour, working essentially just with, uh, with their own labour. And so what we did in, in this context, and this is an intervention now that's been running for over a decade now, and I'll, I'll talk about the reasons why it's so long-lasting in, in the next couple of slides. So this again was working with BRAC, and this is targeting the poorest households in the poorest villages in Bangladesh using a randomized control trial that started in 2007. Okay? These are the initial conditions of those households, you, you, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty abysmal. What we did is we went to these households and we offered them a menu of productive assets. We offered them a list of K. One of the items on that list was, do you want livestock or do you want to set up a small business, blah, blah, blah. And then with each of those items of capital, we said, we'll also train you in how to use that capital. These are households that don't have livestock at baseline. Nobody in their, gener in their family has ever had livestock. They don't know how to, how to rear animals. They've always just been working in agriculture. Okay? Almost all the households eligible households chose a combination of some form of livestock and the cost per beneficiary is just under 300 US dollars. This is a big push intervention. Giving somebody in this context a cow is kind of like a thousand percent increase in their wealth and then providing them with training of a similar value is also you know, a huge uh, resource injection. Again, when I spoke to my colleagues at UCL about this in 2007, they said, well, look, these guys are going to sell the asset on day T plus one, uh, you know, if it, it is, is worth a lot, but that's not what these households do. They're under no obligation to hold on to the asset. They're, they are actually forward-looking and can understand they can generate a return from this asset. Okay. So this is, a, this is a, a study that we've been doing. We've been tracking 20,000 households over this time period. We have 1,400 villages in the sample. Half of the villages receive treatment, half of them not. Uh, and it's a partial population experiment that those individuals who are eligible for the program are the poorest households in this village, but we've been able to trace households across the wealth distribution to look at some of the general equilibrium effects of, of, of these transfers on the village economy. There's lots of interesting stuff there which I won't have time to talk about. But we've been tracking them 
since baseline, the intervention, two, four, seven, and now sort of uh, 12 years, uh, years later. Okay, I'll show you the results for the first uh, seven years, and then I'll talk about why, we, why we've gone to 11 years. Okay, let me just skip through this. So the main results that we find is that there's a big permanent change in the allocation of labour across activities, that eligible households move away from insecure wage labour, and they're able to permanently move into combining their labour with this capital um, over a, over a four-year uh, time period. This causes them to increase their labour supply over the course of the year as a whole and work approximately about two months more e each year. Okay, so get, relaxing these constraints allow these households to supply more labour. As a result, the earnings impacts of the programme are about 30% per annum uh, at, at uh, four or seven years later. Okay, so there are huge returns, permanent returns of these households uh, by, by having this huge injection of, of, uh, of, of capital and, and skills. That feeds through into um, themselves accumulating more assets over time. So they accumulate all forms of, 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 uh, of livestock over time. And in particular, uh, they end up with the total value of livestock after four years being much higher than the initial transfer. So by giving them these assets, they're able to accumulate further assets because uh, they're able to save some of the returns. They reinvest that into other forms of asset that are both animals themselves and in, uh, inputs that are complementary to, to these animals. So you see an accumulation of their asset base. Their consumption rises, their investments rise, their savings rise. What did they use that money for beyond uh, animals? They also used that to rent more land and the result that always, always knocks me off my seat is that they start to own land to a greater extent after four years. So remember, these are the poorest households that were residing you know, on less than a dollar a day at the start. Four years after the intervention, we have about two, three percentage uh, point increase in owning land, starting from a baseline in the control group of about six, seven percent. Okay, that's a big deal in a place like Bangladesh, where population density is close to infinity, and it's very hard to get a uh, hold of land. But why do we care about land as development economists? Because that's a very good proxy for permanent income. That's a very good proxy for you being able to insure against any kind of idiosyncratic shock. Ownership of land is a fundamental uh, asset in these, in these places. These are households that never owned land for generations, and the program's able to kick them over that, over that, over that very extreme threshold. We see improvements in expenditures as... Uh, but, uh, so the MPC is about one-third to one-half, the remainder is saved or invested, or some fraction because it's a partial population experiment. These guys are generating such a large surplus, we start seeing them lend to other households further up the income distribution. And in fact, what's really beautiful is that with the partial population experiment, you can really see the birth of the credit market in these villages. You can really start to see this additional resources flowing from these households to wealthier households, those other households also accumulating assets, and you're essentially changing the growth path of these villages. Okay? And we're looking at that sort of seven years later, 12 years later. Okay? Rate of return to the program is about 14%. It was big push, lots of upfront costs, but lifetime benefits of these households. Okay, and let me just conclude by coming full circle, which is to explain why did we go back after 11, 12 years? Because we wanted to come back to what I was talking about before in terms of early childhood development and try to understand what happened to the kids of these households who were just born around the time of the initial transfer. And now these children are at the point where they've accumulated human capital and just starting to make their labour market choices. Are we able to break that intergenerational cycle of poverty, of occupational choice, and get the kids working with capital as well? Okay, so this, these are results that are just coming, and this is hot off the press. And so we have a whole bunch of kids who are relatively young at the time of the transfer. Some of them were in utero, some of them were early in life, some of them were slightly older and just uh, exiting uh, the formal education system. And so what we exploit for this paper is to compare individuals who were treated initially in 2007 versus those individuals who were in the control group but were treated six years later. Okay, so we're going to have a different timing of, of treatment. Uh, so some households will be treated earlier, some households will be treated later, and there's all kinds of comparisons you can do uh, when, when you, uh, when you uh, look at those differences. So in 2007, for example, if we look at the cohort of kids who were born in 2007, 
Okay. For those who were in the early treated, they were sort of age zero. And for those in the late treated, they, they would have been treated at age six. Okay. And then we're going to observe them all at age 11, just as they're making the transition from primary to secondary. Okay. We're going to... Okay. Can I just... Uh, set So what are the results? We see that those kids who were treated when they were young have improvements in their human capital. We're going back to the Nigeria outcomes. We see reduced stunting, reduced malnutrition for those kids who got the shock early in life. It's harder to shift anthropometric outcomes if you're too old at the time of treatment, as you might expect. You have improvements in schooling for those children. And the best result ever, you have improvements in occupational choice for those kids, especially the boys they're much less likely to go back to engaging in casual work themselves. The intergenerational sort of circle of poverty is broken. They're much more likely to be engaged in these types of activities, combining their labor with capital. And this study gets us back to the first study. The whole cycle is complete, and that's why we're kind of so excited about it. Okay. Very short question. Oh, then not. <laughs> okay, we can. Uh, so our key design question in everything you do uh, to our cities is: What's exactly the treatment that you provide? So why was it twenty dollars instead of fifteen or twenty-five in the Nigerian example? What's the information you provide? How do you think about such choices that you make in terms of learning from these experiences? Okay, so let me, let me talk about that context very specifically because that's that's, um, that, there's a good and a bad answer to that. So for the information, um, the NGO that we're working with is Save the Children. Okay? They'd previously been operating in that part of uh, northwest Nigeria to have a program that promoted vaccination uh, for women. During the... Um, during that intervention, they realized that the knowledge deficits were so severe related to breastfeeding children, other sort of activities to do with children, that they then designed a curriculum that was specific to that context, saying we know that people don't know this type of stuff, and that's what the information that we need to provide. So that was very much based on previous experience, a two-year process where we interviewed uh, parents, we interviewed people working in primary health clinics to really understand what are the first order information constraints. So you do not want to take our curriculum and apply it to Bangladesh, the results will be horribly different. So the first thing is understand your context and get the first order constraints. So that's, that's kind of, I think hopefully that's, that's a sensible answer. The cash is a completely ridiculous answer. So the cash, when we were first working, we were told everybody, you're giving too much cash. There's no way that the economy can absorb this cash. Why do you even think the elasticity of children's outcomes is going to be sensitive? The, the woman's going to give it to the husband, the husband's going to spend it on whatever. Don't give this much money. The answer that we got back from Save the Children was the answer that any, many non-economists would give. They would say, the amount that you need to spend to have a nutritious diet in these, in, in these locations is $20 per month. And that's how they set the metric. And we went blue in the face telling them, but if you give them an, an additional, they're already spending some money on, 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 uh, on consumptions. If you give them an additional $20, they don't need that money. That money is going to be used for other things. We thought it would be used for other forms of consumption. It turns out to be used for savings and, and investment. But that's where that number came from. They were thinking as non-economists and saying, we don't need to top up their resources. We need to provide them resources as if, as if they're spending nothing on food to begin with. Um, and so trying to get that concept across to them is something that we failed at, but hope, I'm, I'm glad we failed at it because the program is, is much better as a result. And so we've been feeding these results into, into policymakers in Nigeria saying what would be the optimal amount that you'd want to transfer. We don't have experimental variation to, to answer that question, but we can do some, some calculations to see you know, heterogeneity in, in, in responses. So that's how you want to think about it. You want to have some kind of uh, anchor in your, in your context. For information, it was very clear. For cash, we made mistakes, but I'm glad we kind of made those mistakes. Okay, thank you very much. I guess we can continue this discussion uh, during the coffee break. So we will have a, well, let's say 10 to 15 minutes coffee break right now. So thank you very much. Thank you.
yksi, yksi, yksi. Kuuluuko tämä hyvin? Kuuluuko hyvin? Kuuluuko hyvin? Yksi, kaksi.
1-2, 1-2.
No, ma ce n'ho un altro con gli amici. No, it's working. Yes. Perfect. I put it on YouTube. Suomekki on mun mielestä vähän parempi. Niin. Mä en tiedä millä vaikka hiukset häiritsee sitä. <tos> Ollaan vähän... The second part of our, our seminar, so Professor Oriana Pandiera is going to talk about the organization of economics and the state. So welcome. Thank and you. <laughs> and continue, please. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And again, thank you for this award. It was completely unexpected. <laughs> Wonderful to receive. I would just like to thank, as uh, Imran said, all the collaborators that have made these projects possible, and especially the children, <laughs> our children, were extremely patient, as you can see, sitting here through this. I've promised them that this would be fun. <laughs> as far as economics go, we'll try to make it fun. <laughs> so um, all the programs that we've been evaluating and the wonderful effects that these programs have, have to be implemented. And the only way of implementing programs at scale is through the state. So what we have to worry about when it comes to program implementation is the people. Not the beneficiaries, but the people who actually implement the program. And the state is made essentially of people. This is uh, the share of employee compensation in public spending in 2010. And you see that the poorer the country, the bigger that share. So the state spends most of its resources into paying people that work for it. So the success or failure of state policies essentially hinges on hiring the right people, motivating them on the job, and making sure that they use their talent for the purpose of the policies that they are implementing. The question is, how far are we from this? Okay. Well, there are agency problems in bureaucracies, like in every organization, 
And in essence, the agency problem is that uh, the principal, the state, hires an agent, say a teacher, to teach. The success of the task, that is the learning of the students, depends on the effort of the teacher, which is unobservable by the principal. This means that the agent will choose the level of effort that makes them happy, and that's often different from what the principal wants. Now, the fundamental issue here to solve this problem is to understand where the misalignment comes from. And there are two sources of misalignment. The agent could just be lazy, so the teacher would prefer to watch her favorite TV program or read a book instead of preparing the lectures. That means, technically, that the agent puts a higher weight on the cost of effort than the principal does. Okay? We call that passive waste, in the sense it creates a waste which does not directly monetarily benefit the agent, but it's a waste nevertheless. The second possibility, which kept, keeps coming up and up over and over again when we talk about the state and employees of the state, is that the agent is corrupt. Uh, for instance, I mean, corruption means that he exploits his position for his own private gain. So, for instance, in the example of the teacher, the teacher could be selling exam papers in order to profit personally, but, of course, destroying the purpose of, of the task. Now, telling them apart is very difficult because the symptoms are the same. We result, in the case of the teacher, in poor learning outcomes. But it is essential because the cure for one can make the other one worse. So if we design a system that tries to curtail corruption, where the true source of uh, inefficiency is passive waste, the passive waste will become bigger. So, there are two common solutions to these problems. There are rules, that is, we can define the behavior of the agent to extreme details, or there are incentives, that is, we can set up the job in a way that the agent gets rewards for a behavior which is desirable by the principal. So that's what I will do mostly today. I will review some work that I've been doing on these issues. The work comes mostly from low-income countries, but I think it's relevant everywhere. It comes mostly from uh, field experiments, and it is only on bureaucrats or frontline workers. So I'm not talking about politicians here. These are people who are hired by the state, they're not elected. Right, let's start with the favorite solution of every government on the planet, rules. Rules prescribe behavior and limit the discretion of the agent, right? The issue is that they require monitoring, and the outcome is that they might be good at curtailing what we call active waste. So if your hands are tied, there's only so much corruption you can engage in, but that might come at the price of more inefficiency. Now, let me give you an example. I found this on the internet, where you can find everything. Uh, this is the rules that the procurement officers for the U.S. Marines have to follow when they want to buy brownies or chocolate chip cookies. This document is 26 pages long. <laughs> it gives you in great detail what nuts should look like in these cookies. But not just any nuts, they go by type of nuts. <coughs> if you have almonds, they tell you the dimension of the almonds and the share of almonds that has to satisfy that dimension, so 95%. Uh, if you have walnuts, the share, for some reason, goes down to 90%. So the wonder is, what happens to pecans? Is it going to be 92% or something? It's 90% too. So there is an enormous level of detail that completely removes the discretion of the procurement agents of course, this prevents the procurement agents from being corrupt. So if the procurement agent has you know, a cousin that produces chocolate chip cookies and he wants to give the contract to the cousin, he cannot unless the cousin finds all these tools that the government requires to measure the walnuts. But at the same time, it completely kills any initiative, any local information 
that the agent could use for the benefit of, uh, of the principal. This goes on and on and on. You know, there's requirements on the weights. The weight cannot be less than 46 grams exactly. It's really not clear how these things are taken. Now, at the other extreme, you have companies like Netflix. Uh, Netflix policy for expensing entertainment, gift and travel is simply acting Netflix best interest. Okay? This policy gives the employees full discretion on what to do, including things that will get you arrested if you did it in a government agency, like if you have to use the phone to make a call, and it's better for you to make the call from the office so that you don't waste time, you can do so, because that's better for the company, as opposed to going home, making the call, and coming back. Right? Now, the question is, which of these two systems enables people to use their talent better is pretty clear, because in the first type of excessive rule environment, there is no discretion, so it doesn't matter how talented you are, you're never going to use it. So the question is whether no, the state can be run like Netflix. Could we eliminate all the rules? Could we give autonomy to state employees or would that be a result in a complete disaster? Is, that is, is there something specific about public ownership that requires that level of rules and monitoring? Imran and uh, co-authors have uh, two papers which are really nice, in which they use the management surveys that uh, Nick Bloom, John Marina, and uh, Rafaela Saduna put together to measure management practices in the civil service. She's super cool because we normally think of these things for firms. They apply it to the civil service. And they do so in two countries which are well known for their level of corruption, so Nigeria and Ghana. And uh, they find that there is a large variation in the level of autonomy that different public bodies have. Now, that in itself makes you think that it's no, by no means necessary to have a large amount of red tape. Because if that were necessary, we should find no variation. We should find that every public body has the same strict rules as the US Marines. Okay? So what they do is that they correlate this level of autonomy with performance. Performance in the construction of development projects. The measures of performance are very neat because they are uh, calculated by an independent team of engineers. So these are projects like bridges and roads and things of this nature. And what they find, well, what they find first, this is going the other way around, I'm sorry. The first thing that they find is that performance is abysmal. 30% of projects are completed, 30%. A big chunk are not even started. So the money is dispersed and it kind of evaporates. Then there is a completion proportion of all sorts of things in the middle, and 30% are completed. So what is the effect of autonomy on these things? This is Nigeria and that's Ghana. You see, they're very similar, and in both cases, both the starting rates and the completion rates are higher in public bodies that give more autonomy. So the question then that arises is, is this a causal relationship? That is, if we take a public body where the agents have very low autonomy, they're kind of like the US Marines with the chocolate chip cookies, and we throw away that document and say, you know, just find the best chocolate chip cookies for the Marines, what would happen? That's what we set up to do in a recent experiment with uh, Michael Bess, Adnan Khan, and Andrea Pratt, where we change the level of autonomy for procurement officers in none other than Pakistan. Uh, in Pakistan, procurement officers, well, procurement, why procurement? Procurement is the ultimate agency problem. What's the job of a procurement agent? The procurement agent buys goods that he will never use with money that's not his own. So it doesn't get any more agency problem than that. Okay. So 
these procurement officers, you can imagine, they're officers, say, in a university. They receive orders from the different departments. Department of Medicine calls and says, we need 50 computers of this specification. So the procurement officer has a budget. He goes out to look for computers. He has to get three quotes. There are all sorts of rules. And before they can do anything, that is, before they can pay the vendor, they need to get approved by the auditor office. Okay? So that is the status quo. The public body requires the PO to buy an item, so the Department of Medicine asks for 50 computers. The PO surveys the market and chooses a vendor. Then he sends a request for approval to the auditor office. At that point, the auditor office can quickly process the documentation and pay the vendor, or can take his time and say, well, you didn't send me this document and this other document. The authority to decide what to do resides entirely with the auditor office. And the reason why this is put in place is the fear that the procurement officers could actually steal. <coughs> so what we do in this project is that we take a sample of uh, 600 public bodies across 26 districts and four departments. We assign them randomly to either control or autonomy for the purchase of generic goods. Generic goods are things that we all buy. Okay? And I'll tell you in a second why we want generic goods. Uh, the autonomy treatment consists in two parts. We give them a small amount of cash, which is about 10% of their budget. This cash they can spend however they want. Okay? They can go, if they find a good deal in a shop for buying computers, they can pay cash. They don't need to wait for the AG to approve it. Or, for the rest, we give them a, a list of documents which has been approved by the Ministry of Finance, and this is the only documents that the AG can ask. So if they bring in this list, the, 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 all the documents on the list, the AG can not waste time and say, no, you have to bring me back the green stamp because you brought me the red stamp, but I wanted the green. Because on the list, it says, the red stamp is okay. So both of the treatments shift power from the auditor to the agent, clearly. It gives them freedom to save, because now that they don't have to wait for the approval, they can find vendors who are more willing to sell to them. But they also give them the opportunity to steal, right? because the AG cannot ask for further checks, and because the cash itself can be stolen very easily. So why generics? There are many buyers and many sellers of generic goods, so the action of the government do not change the price. And most importantly, we can compare them. If we were to look at roads or bridges, no two bridges are the same. But for computers, once we have the exact specification, we can see whether the procurement officer is getting a good deal or not. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the data on these purchases exist, but they exist in a room, in a very dusty room, full of sacks of papers of receipts collected throughout the years. So that's not amenable to statistical analysis. So as a side project, we built this system with the Procurement Authority in Punjab and the Information Technology Board, which allows us to collect for every purchase that these people do, the price paid and all the characteristics. So, for instance, if you buy printing papers for the university, you can choose the type of printing paper. You see there is a photo printing paper for the EMG machine in hospital and so on. And then you can fill in all the details. So that gives us a data set of individual purchases, and for each individual purchases, we know exactly the price paid and the characteristics of that good that was bought. Okay? So the first thing, which is quite interesting, is that despite these being very homogeneous goods, different public bodies pay very different prices for the same good. So if you set the, the price of a standardized piece of paper 
if you say look at the paper that's worth 1.25, you find the worst performers pay up to 180 for a paper, for a piece of paper which is worth 125. And the good performers pay as low as 0.7. So the variation is quite large. Now what happens when we give them autonomy? Prices fall by 9%. The average price paid for a generic good, so our sample comprehends things like papers, computers, chairs, tables, blocks of ice, you can't think of anything more uniform than that. The average price falls by 9%. The quality, the composition, and the timing of purchase do not change. Now, if we only look at the savings within the sample, these savings could fund five schools or 75 hospital beds in a year. So year after year, it all sums up. If you scale it up to all the generic budgets, because these are only our sample public bodies, that the savings will be up to 70 million per year. To put that number in context, the average GDP per capita in Punjab is $1,500. So there's a lot of waste that's created by these excess rules. But why is that? Well, auditing takes time. We don't know whether the auditor themselves are corrupt, or it's just the sheer time that it takes to process all this paperwork. But the fact that the vendors cannot be paid before the auditor has approved means that only certain vendors can afford to wait, because sometimes these delays are like six, eight months long. And those who are willing to wait make you pay for waiting. They charge you an implicit interest rate. There is no point for the public officer to find better deals because even if they do, at the moment where they say, oh, fantastic, vendor ven sells me these computers, the vendor says, I want to be paid now. The moment you tell the vendor you have to wait eight months, the deal is gone. Okay? So there's no point for them to find better deals. Removing the decision making from the auditor actually enables the public, the procurement officer, to use their talent and local information to find better deals. And to show that, we have a measure, which now I don't have much time to... Oh well, I can explain you very quickly what this is. This is the share of transactions that are approved at the last minute. The budget here goes from July to June. So this is the share of transactions that the AG approves really at the last minute. You see that when the AG is fast, the effect of autonomy is zero. It makes no difference whether it's the AG who has the power or the, or the agent themselves. But the vast majority of AGs in our sample are very slow. When the AGs are very slow, there is up to a 15% drop in prices. Right? So that is consistent with the idea that the enforcement of the rules creates inefficiencies which lead to higher prices. Okay. And this is to close the loop. It shows how the long delays, so that's in days, uh, delays of seven to eight months, go down in the treatment group. So this doesn't happen only in Punjab. You know, as economists, we're obsessed with incentives. We rarely look at other aspects of job design. So autonomy is not the thing <laughs> that everybody does, but it's getting there. So there is a, a, a nice paper by Esther Duflo and many co-authors that look at environmental inspections in Gujarat. They do the opposite of what we do. They take away autonomy from the inspectors. They give them a list of uh, plants to inspect. That increases the number of plants that they inspect, but it's completely useless because the inspector knows where to go. The list that's generated by the researchers contains many plants that do not pollute. We have a paper uh, in Italy where, again, we use uh, public procurement data to show that rules that are designed to curtail corruption end up creating large efficiency losses. Okay. So what's the alternative to that? The alternative is what we always think of, which is motivating people on the job, giving people incentives. Okay. 
Performance rewards uh, motivate instead of regulate. The idea is that you want to give the agent a stake in the success of the project. The idea is flawless. Okay? Yet, you might have heard, because there is a million examples, of incentives in the public sector that backfire. Okay? There is the famous example from the Florida elementary school teachers who were given a bonus based on the test scores of their children in the exams. What they did was to give, the exam, to give the children sugary drinks before the exam, so the kids would perk up, the test scores would go up, the learning would remain unchanged, and the dental bills would go up as well. Okay. The second example comes from England. This is a long time ago now. Uh, accident and emergency, so the ER, had very long waiting times. So the government decided to give hospitals incentives based on waiting times. How do they measure waiting times from the moment in which the patient enters the A&E the A department? So what does the A&E department do? They keep the patient outside in the ambulance. And this generates long waits and shortages of ambulances. Now, what I, I kept hidden from you on purpose is that we did try incentives on the procurement officers in Punjab. And what we got was exactly zero. There you go. That's autonomy, that's incentive and autonomy combined, and that's incentives alone. They had no effect. Now, these incentives were super strong. There was a price like the top 10% of performers could get twice as much of their salary. So it's not a matter of the incentive not being powerful enough, it's clearly <laughs> something else. So what do we have to think of when we think of incentives? Well, the first is that there has to be a reward that the agent wants. Okay? So we normally give money, people tend to like money, but people care about many other things. They care about their reputation, they care about their friends and family, they care about their relative standing, in some cases, they might care about society as a whole. This might matter for nurses and, and teachers. Let me give you an example from another piece of work um, where we uh, try exactly, sorry, this is not very visible. We try exactly the same experiment on these are data entry operators. We give them a fixed wage or a piece rate. And we try this in three different countries. These countries vary in the level of individualism that they have. So individualism is a cultural measure, how much you like to stand out, to make more money than others. That's the correlation. These three countries are Ghana, the Philippines, and India. They sit at the opposite, Ghana and India are at the opposite end of the spectrum. Ghana is very collectivistic. India is very individualistic for being a low-income country. And the Philippines are exactly in the middle. What we find is that the effect of incentives is increasing in the level of individualism of the country. So if culturally it is acceptable to be seen to be better than others, incentives work. And uh, to show that it is a cultural mechanism, we vary the visibility of these prices. When the prices are visible, that's the second graph there, in the Philippines, there is no effect whatsoever. And in India, the effect becomes stronger. Okay? So the way we reward people has to be compatible with what they conceive of as a reward. Now, the second ingredient is that we need a good measure of performance. The measure is good if it can be meaningfully affected by the agent, if it depends mostly on the agent effort and not on a uh, external parameters, if it's based on objective facts rather than subjective evaluation, and if it captures all the relevant dimensions of the jobs. And that's where it becomes really tricky to give incentives, because there are very few jobs where you can measure performance so precisely. In our case, the obvious mistake was that the performance, the prices that the, the procurement officer paid didn't really depend on his effort. They depended a lot on how quickly the auditor was approving purchases. 
And indeed, if we allow the effect of incentives to depend on how quick the auditor is, you see that incentives are effective where the auditor is quick. But when the auditor is slow, there is nothing that the PO can do. So we gave people a reward based on an action that they cannot control, based on an outcome over which they have no control. So these problems, oh, this is actually very neat. This is uh, uh, the, a famous experiment that uh, Esther Duflo ran with uh, co-authors in India. The problem there was that teachers didn't show up in school. So they set up a system of incentives where teachers were given a camera. They had to take a photo of themselves and their children in the classroom. And then their pay would depend on the number of photos that they would send in. The program was incredibly successful. Absenteeism went down, learning went up, the kids got promoted onto state school, and everybody was happy. And the, the authors made quite an effort to try and scale this up. And so, the, this is in Rajasthan, the, the, health, the Ministry of Health took it up. Okay? And so, this was implemented in the health sector for nurses. Same exact schemes, the photos every day, the payment as a function of the photos. But what happened there? What happened there was not that the researchers were implementing it. It was the boss of the nurses who was implementing the scheme. And the researchers have no relationship with the agents. Their incentive is to implement the scheme as well as possible, so the paper comes out on AER. The boss of the nurses, on the other hand, has a social relationship with the nurses. And perhaps they don't care quite as much to implement the scheme correctly. And indeed, what happens is that in a few months, the local health administration undermined the scheme by accepting all sorts of excuses. Like, oh yes, I took a picture, but the dog ate my camera, and that would be a valid excuse. And so that was the end of the effectiveness of the incentives which is an important lesson, I will return on this point, it's an important lesson for the scalability of all these projects that we put on the field, because projects which are implemented by researchers will not be implemented in the same way once you leave them to the organizations themselves. Now, this is nothing to do with the state. Okay? We seem to think that these problems are more severe in public organizations, but that's not quite true. Okay? So when good measures are available, and we know what the agent wants, performance rewards work well. And there is examples like Kartik Muladinaran's work in India show that incentives for teachers work quite well. Okay? So none of these problems are specific to the state, with the exception of possibly one, which is prosociality. Okay? Many of the which would affect NGOs to the same extent, many of the jobs, especially frontline workers, have a prosocial element. So people who self-select into being nurses in rural communities, they tend to care about the job that they do. So one possibility is that giving them incentives doesn't have an effect because they already have all the motivation that they can possibly get. Huh? However, one possibility, and this is a very common concern that you often hear in policy circles, is that actually incentives can backfire. How can they backfire? Because they attract the wrong type of nurse. They attract people who do it for the money. Okay? And this was precisely the concern of the Ministry of Health director in Zambia when he was about to launch a recruitment drive for rural nurses back in 2010. Okay? This is, tells you the, the length of time that it takes to implement these projects. This is the question that he asked us. If we put, so the question there was whether they should give career incentives to these new nurses. The basic, um, the basic uh, context was one in which they wanted to take people that normally work as nurses for informal institutions, like NGOs or the church, they wanted to recruit them in the state, train them, and send them back in their communities. Now, they faced the choice between 
making this position official Ministry of Health positions, so in the career ladder of the Ministry of Health, or leaving them informal as community health workers, but trained and paid by the state. And this is the question that the HR director asked us. What will happen now that they see themselves as civil servants? Will they retain that connection to the community that motivates them in the first place? So this is the last part of, uh, I went upward, hiring the right people. Do incentives help us hire the right people? And what's the right person? So we designed an experiment to answer the Mr. Mwila's question. Of course, he didn't think he would have to wait 10 years for the answer. <laughs> the answer was pretty clear after two years, so he didn't expect for the publication of the paper to implement the results of the findings. So we, basically what we did, uh, this is a recruitment experiment. It's a new position created to uh, have rural nurses. The problem with Zambia is there's a very low density, it's the country of Bangladesh, it's a very low density populated place. And rural areas are really far, and it takes forever to get there because the roads are bad. So the standard approach is to take nurses and post them there. The nurse gets there, runs away. That's the typical problem. The idea was to recruit from the community and to appeal to the type of person that normally does this job for NGOs and the like. So in the control group, we recruited as much as possible to make it look like the standard community-based NGO job. The headline said, do you want to serve your community? Become a community health worker. Everything else in the poster is the same as the treatment, which I will show you shortly. And the benefits listed up there made precise that the main benefit of doing this job was to help the community to become a respected member of the community, to help mothers and children in the community. The treatment puts a completely different spin on it. Okay? This goes full blast on a career path. The headline says, become a community health worker to gain skills and boost your career. Among the benefits, we list accessing future career opportunities, including clinical officer, nurse, environmental health technologist. And that's a very steep slope because the child was making at the time $300 a month, the nurse was a 500, the environmental health technician a 600. So it puts a lot of emphasis on building up your career. So what happened? I can tell you for sure that one group did a lot better. Now, think, try to guess which did better, and then you tell me whether you guessed it right. Okay. Normally I have a poll, but the internet is not working. But you can tell me, maybe by show of hands, who thinks that the control group did better? The community motivation, maybe you know. Okay, so, and who thinks that the career did better? One and two. Any undecided? Okay, very well. All right, what you have in mind is the following. Imagine that you have people with different social motivation, different hearts. You go from an empty-hearted person <laughs> to a full-hearted person. These are for Penelope, <laughs> who wanted drawings. Okay? So the idea is that if you pay very little, or if you give low career incentives, if there is nothing in the job but to help the community, the only people that will apply are those with very high prosocial preferences. Okay? As you move the rewards, you start attracting people who do it for the rewards. That's pretty logical. Okay? And that's what everybody fears. You give people money or material benefits of any type, you attract people that don't care that much about the job, they do it for the money. Now, there's something else, however, that changes. And that's ability, okay? Now you go, you have three types of individuals, empty-headed, 
kind of silly. Normal guy, half head, and genius at the top. Now, normally, you know, the market rewards ability. So if you pay little, you only get that guy. If you pay more, you get this guy. If you get, you get that guy. So this is all the possible applicants that you have. You have every combination from the selfish, silly one, who you're trying to avoid like the plague, <laughs> to the well-meaning, silly one, who's also a bit problematic, to the dream employee, who's the guy at the top, who's you know, not only very prosocial, but also very intelligent. So how does the application pool changes with rewards? Well, with low rewards, you're sure to get a very prosocial person. But because the market rewards ability, if the rewards are very low, this person will not be the smartest stick in the box. As you increase the material rewards, you move in both dimensions. You get more cold-hearted people, but also more intelligent people, and so on. Okay? Now, this is the concern, right? That if you take one person at random out of the applicant pool, that person will be more intelligent, but also less prosocial. And if you look at what we get, we have two measures of uh, cognitive skills. We have their total exam scores in the high school exams and the number of science exams that they took. And the, you know, the treatment attracts people with better qualifications on average. But it also attracts people who are less prosocial. And that's exactly what everybody expects. But the question is, out of this pool, these are all guys who all have applied. Who would you choose? Would you really choose the median when you can hire the guy at top? Right? Nobody would choose the median. And indeed, the selection panels that were hiring these candidates, we know all the grades that they gave to all the candidates. They chose the people at the very top. You see, the median draw, say, in the exam scores gives you somebody with an exam score of 24.9. The guy that got hired had 27. So he was really the smartest person in the pool. But because you have smarter people who apply with treatment, the smartest person in treatment is smarter than the smartest person in control. And this also eliminated the difference in prosociality. Prosociality is the same. So, this is a general result. Despite me putting it with a little man with heads and hearts, this is a general result as long as the reward to ability in the private sector is higher, which is generally the case. As long as that's true, the most able applicant will always be the most prosocial. Why is that? Because these guys who have the same ability but don't care about health in the community as much will not apply. So you don't even need to have measures of prosociality. The measure of ability by itself, due to the sorting into the job, will proxy also for prosociality. Okay, so the concern, summing up, the concern that giving material benefits can actually attract cold-hearted applicants who do it for the money is true. That is, these people apply, but you don't have to hire them. Right? Only if you choose at random, you will get one of these. If you choose the best applicant, that will be both more prosocial and uh, more intelligent. Now, does any of this matter? Well, the stakes are very high. Uh, we followed them for one and two years, and we measure how many visits they do, how many community meetings they organize, and uh, how many patients they see at the health post. We find that those in the career treatment do 30% more visits and twice as many community meetings. Now, this feeds directly into usage. One key problem in Zambia and in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, like Imran was saying, 
is that uh, uh, people do not give birth in hospitals. They give birth at home. Many things that are very easily solvable if you give birth in hospital can be lethal if you give birth at home. So a key target for most organizations is to get women to go to the hospital. And in the treatment group, institutional deliveries increased by 30%. Okay? And vaccination rates increased by 22%. Bottom line, two years down the line, we run a household survey. We measure health behaviors, most of them improve, and we measure anthropometrics for the children. Okay? We weight the children. And there is a 25% drop in malnutrition. All of that by getting the right people in. So what do we learn from all of this? A um, couple of things. Well, three things I stress there. The first is that when we say the state is made of people, I stack them up as a pyramid intentionally. The state, like most organizations, is a hierarchy. And every layer of that hierarchy has an incentive problem, has an agency problem. We tend to focus on one layer at a time, and that can be quite disastrous because the layers are interdependent, and therefore focusing on one at a time gives unpredictable results because we don't know how the other layer is going to react. This is particularly important, and I cannot stress this more, for the portability of experimental findings. We now have a very large body of RCTs that tells us what works and what doesn't work in developing countries, mostly. But this is now expanding to high-income countries as well. But the key thing is that most of these RCTs are implemented by researchers. Okay, so the researcher, like the camera experiment, as their research managers went to Rajasthan, implemented the experiment. That is, they were there counting the photos and say, OK, this guy has 20 photos, hence 300 rupees. This guy has 30 photos, 500 rupees. Okay? Most of this experiment, researchers won't control. So most of these experiments are implemented by researchers in conditions of perfect control. But we don't care about the experiment implemented by researchers. We care about scaling it up to a bigger context, right? We care about the organizations uptaking these results. So in Zambia, the Ministry of Health only uses career posters now. Okay? Notice that, I'll tell you an anecdote, uh, for the, when we had to decide how to choose the, um, the community health workers who had applied, many colleagues suggested you should choose them at random because that will give you total control. But on the other hand, this was people's lives that we were talking about. And uh, so we chose them as the Ministry of Health would have chosen them had they continued with our experiment. That is, we let them form selection panels, and we respected the decisions of the selection panel. Now, if you remember the numbers that I showed you comparing the mean, actually, I have a little time, so this is an important point. I'll show them again. If you compare the means from a random choice to what the selection panel did, they're quite different. Right? <coughs> have we gone? Uh, how does that work? Well, you see, the selection is in pink and the mean is in black. Had we gone for the random choice, we would have got, I mean, we would have shown the theoretical point that you attract less prosocial but more intelligent people in the career treatment. But if the thing were implemented by the Ministry of Health, it would have looked very different. So they implications of the findings and the recommendation that we could have given to the Ministry of Health, had we chosen a random, so do the best from the point of view of research, would have been dramatically different. We would have said there is a trade-off between ability and prosociality. So you have to be careful in offering uh, career incentives to these people. And that would have had quite an impact 
on the health outcomes. Okay. So what, what the actors themselves do, that is, is very different from what researchers would have done. And we have to understand that in order to scale up these programs. Okay. So same thing with the experiment in Punjab. When we designed that experiment, and we went around uh, to the various offices in the procurement agency, everybody was interested. I mean, people thought that the procurement officers would steal the money. There's a great deal of mistrust. But they thought that it was worth trying. The one that was vehemently against it was the auditor office, because clearly they lost 10%. So it's very, very important to understand how the interaction between the different layers. We are, I think, economists, we are, our mind is stuck on the principal agent, one principal, one agent, but organizations have many agents in different layers. And if we don't start thinking of the interaction across those layers, we'd get to very misleading results. Uh, the second lesson which uh, kind of resonates the old work for which we got this award, is the importance of the social context. So in our work, in, uh, uh, back then in, uh, in the UK, with the firm, we were looking at friendship relationships and how working with friends changes the way you respond to incentives and vice versa. But there is a whole host of factors that affect how people behave. So I got you the example of the cultural differences across countries. Um, that was inspired by our own problem with the numerators. We were in Zambia actually entering the data for the experiment on the nurses. We had a team of six enumerators, two data entry sorry, officers. Two were super fast, and the remaining four were terrible. So we saw in the good old tradition of Goldman Sachs, to put a ranking every week of the top data entry people. You know what happened? Productivity fell dramatically because the top two started working more slowly. So we had posted the rankings to make the bottom guys work faster. And what happened was that the top two went slower. And when we asked them, why did you do that? They said, because by putting our names there, you make our friends look bad by posting the difference in productivity, you make us look good, but you make them look bad. And that was more important to them. And that's what gave us the idea of running that experiment across different cultures. So it, is, it, seems, it seems so trivial when you say it like this, but if we don't know what people want, we can't possibly incentivize them. And there is no doubt that money is good, but if money interacts in negative ways with uh, other motivators, then the effects can be quite surprising. A thing that we do not know, but I think would be super interesting to find out, is whether autonomy in itself can be motivating. So in our Punjab experiment, the way we interpret the results is that autonomy gives them freedom to use their talent but maybe it also gives them motivation to do so. Maybe being trusted has in itself a motivating effect. You know, research on these issues is really at the beginning. I think it's very promising, and hopefully we'll see more of it. And the final point that I want to make is that selection is probably the most important thing. Because if you, like me, had spent about 20 years looking at the effect of incentives, you know that the, the top that you can get, the most that you can get out of a person, is to improve their productivity by 20%. Okay? If you look at all the experiments that have been done comparing fixed wages to peace rates, those that are successful improve productivity by 20%. It's kind of a limit to the human uh, to where human effort can take you. Okay? You are at 100. If I incentivize you to work like mad, you get to 120. If you look at the dispersion of productivity across individuals, that's 
orders of magnitudes larger. So we want to make people productive, but I think attracting the right people for the job is the most important thing. Right? And we need to understand how autonomy can attract different individuals. And this is the final external validity point that I want to make, that when we run these experiments, and we say we give autonomy to the procurement officers, these were people who signed up for a job that had no autonomy at all. So we are studying the effect of giving autonomy to people who didn't care that much about having autonomy, because otherwise they wouldn't have signed up for the government. The question is, what's the effect of autonomy on people who do care about it? We don't know. And would autonomy attract different type of individuals, potentially corrupt, more corrupt individuals, which you have to weight off against the fact that now that the auditor has less power, the people attracted to the auditor job might be more honest. So there are a lot of things that we still don't know about these issues. I think the main lesson is that these things are very interesting, that there is no much difference between the private and the public sector, because people are all the same, and that we have to be a bit more cautious in understanding how the motivation of different people interact across the hierarchy um, before we go and try to improve their uh, productivity by giving them incentives, autonomy, or any other form of job design. I thought I had to leave time for questions. So I, I scheduled this to have time for a discussion. So I hope you have many questions, so otherwise we'll you go home early. Please. So uh, the scale up, so they hired, I should have given more context. The way we did it was uh, we worked with the government the first year that they implemented this program. So nobody knew what the program was about. And that's why we could advertise it differently in different districts. Uh, the NGOs, there is a value in moving these uh, community health workers to the government rather than the NGOs because the government provides proper training. The NGO jobs are typically informal jobs where people are not trained medically to do. And they're also very lowly paid, if paid at all. So it is true that if it weren't for this program, maybe these people would have been working for NGOs, but it's not clear to me that that would have been a preferable outcome. Oh, so, yes, definitely. So the idea here, as every career, every organization, you're not guaranteed promotion. You're put on a ladder, at the bottom rung of the ladder. The alternative would have been to hire them as a separate cadre altogether. And they discussed that, and that's why we run the experiment. So we, eventually, the government chose, based on these results, to put them on the ladder, so they have career prospects, yes. Any other questions? She was first, yeah. 
gender impacts. Uh, in, uh, I don't know, at least in Finland, the, these um, professions tend to be very segregated uh, within men. Um, so that is um, the uh, uh, women tend to favor professions that would require more thought um, on, on average. So uh, I always get this question whether there are differences between women and men. And actually, let me give you the short answer and then the long answer. The short answer is no. We don't find any difference in the performance of uh, women and men, and we don't find any differences in, uh, um, in who gets selected. Okay? So we get an equal, a balanced split between women and men, and the, uh, and the performance is the same. Now, I once gave, somebody asked me this question, not about this project, about another project, and I said, if I had a penny for every time somebody asked me the difference between women and men, I'd be very rich at this point. And I conjectured that there would be no difference. And so with a group of co-authors, we actually collected all the experiments that have been done on incentives, both in the lab and in the field, and we do a Bayesian meta-analysis of the effect of the incentive and of the difference between women and men. And the upshot is that incentives increase productivity by 20%, as I told you, and the difference between women and men is zero. And it's very precisely estimated. So I don't think there is... The occupational segregation is another issue. But in terms of how they respond to incentives, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that that's different. The occupational segregation point is a very important one because especially employment and the demand for the social care jobs is skyrocketing due to aging population and so on. And the unemployment of men is also skyrocketing. And there is basically a mismatch because men do not want to apply for these jobs. A student of mine who's on the market this year has an experiment that tries precisely to answer that question, why don't men go into prosocial jobs? And uh, the answer, at the risk of spoiling the surprise, is, uh, is one of, uh, they don't find them challenging enough. They think it, they are not challenging. And so when the organization, this is an organization that does social work in the UK, when they change the advertisement to make the job sound challenging, they get many more men to apply. I guess there was, yeah. That's, that's a very good question. And I, as I said, this is the effect of autonomy given to people who have chosen to do a job without autonomy whatsoever. And it didn't, we measured everything. It didn't occur to us to measure stress. So it's a very good suggestion for a future experiment on autonomy. You're right. I, I, we didn't think about it. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we are done. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Um, I guess Antti wants to close the seminar, but before that I just want to inform you that the uh, seminar was streamed and the slides, oh, is it okay to put the slides on website and uh, the uh, lectures are available on the um, uh, Rioanso Foundation's website on Monday, I guess, or on Tuesday. Uh, we have seen that the selection committee of the EEA has done an excellent job.